I just thought I'd let you know, Lola is a photographer. She's a motivational speaker, a writer, an adventurer, a scuba dive master, and also a commercial pilot. Uh, she has won many awards for her photography and now also for her writing. So I seem she does well, whatever she takes on. She describes herself as being addicted to slow travel. Um, and she's been on several safaris. Uh, she's going to talk about a safari today. So, and also uh, treks and a trek for, Lo for Lola. For me, a trek is, uh, you know, driving down to the, to the Bay shore and walking for a few kilometers, but uh, she's gone on ancient Incan trails in Peru through the Akshayak Pass in Nunavut and a uh, 128 kilometer trek in Guatemala, just to name a few. So that's a trek for Lola. Um, she's a scuba dive master, a pilot, and she earned a dog musher certificate in the Yukon. I thought that was pretty interesting. So she has lots to write about and also to talk about, and she's taken some pretty good photography as well. So uh, with that, I will pass the floor over to you and it's the floor and the screen and I'm gonna <laughs> mute myself. Oh, wait, there's three to admit. Let me admit, <laughs> that's the problem. Next time, I think I'll have to just let everybody join when they come in. <clears throat> um, so yes, Lola, I'm gonna ask everybody to stay muted. Please ask your questions and we will, Lola will answer them after her talk. Um, and I don't think I need to say anything more. Do you, Lola? I think I'm good. <laughs> no, that's great. So thank you very much, Wendy. And thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining with me tonight as we travel into Morocco, sand, sea, and summit. So we've been looking at this photo for a while, and I'm sure you've now read at the bottom, it says the Marrakesh Souk. And I took it a couple years ago on my most recent trip uh, to Morocco, which is one of my favorite countries. And I did point out that uh, it looks like this photo could have been taken many, many years before 2019, except for this fellow right here. So, of course, I was tempted to maybe excise them, but it adds to it, I think. Puffy uh, jackets and runners just weren't in fashion in uh, 1910, where it looks like this photo could have been. So Morocco is one of my favorite countries. It has a rich cultural heritage and it has a very diverse landscape that offers a great variety of um, travel experiences. So what can we do in Morocco? Well, lots of things. It's one of three countries in the world that has a coastline on the Atlantic Ocean as well on the Mediterranean Sea. So we could obviously do beach stuff, we could go fishing, we could go swimming, we could move inland to Marrakesh, which is one of the four so-called imperial cities, that is from the, um, the uh, Sultan, uh, periods of the Sultan. The other three of the imperial cities are Rabat, which is the capital and has been since 1912, Meknes and Fez. We could visit a Roman ruin right here about where this airplane is. And it, this is an international airport, but it flies only to Europe and the rest of Africa. Um, down here in Wurzerzat, that's where the Atlas Film Studio is. And then we'll uh, see, uh, I'll mention some of the movies that have been filmed there and you'll know them. One of the ones that wasn't filmed there is Casablanca, which was filmed entirely in the United States. We can uh, summit Je Jebel Tubkal, the tallest mo mountain in North Africa. It's part of the Grand Atlas uh, mountain range. Uh, moving further east, we can go to what's called a Palmyre, an oasis. Rusani, which are the gateway cities or <laughs> villages uh, to the desert, to the Sahara Desert. And we're also gonna go to the Hamada Desert. Um, and then moving further north into Chef Shawen, you'll notice it's actually spelled incorrectly on this map, but it's Chef, like the master chef, Chef Shawen, which uh, is a very secretive blue city. And it was um, uh, very, very well guarded and uh, Christians were not allowed um, and not encouraged until um, after 1920. And then finally, we could go up here to Tangier, uh, which surprisingly enough had, had has a very thriving gay scene, which um, uh, started in the uh, 1940s following World War II. Until about the past hundred years, the, the, the most recent century, uh, Morocco has had a very 
um, turbulent history of invasion uh, and instability. Now it's now a very stable country, but uh, in 300 BC, uh, in, invaders from Italy, that is the Romans came and they conquered as far as uh, this village here, Volubilis, and that was in the third century BC. Um, following that, they were there for 600 years and they left in 300, approximately 300 AD. Then in the eighth century, uh, invaders from Tunisia, Muslim invaders from Tunisia, coming from further east, of course, moved westward into Morocco. And that started a series of sultanate periods that was largely um, a lot of infighting and instability. And that started with the uh, Idrisids. It was led by Muli Idris in 789. And following that, there was unbelievably the Almoravids, the Almohads, the Marinids, the Watasids, the Saudians. And then starting in 1666, um, today's ruling family, the Alawites. And you'd think, well, if it's been one ruling family since 1666, wouldn't that be nice and calm? But of course not. Um, following the end of the Napoleonic Wars in France, that was in 1822, both France and Spain set their um, colonizing eyes on Morocco. So for 90 years, they were fighting, uh, trying for control of Morocco. France finally won. And in 1912, Morocco signed peace treaties with Spain and France, giving France the ultimate power. And at that point over here, you can see it became um, a sultanate, uh, pardon me, a, a, a protectorate, a French protectorate, rather than a sultanate. However, they ruled together for the first 15 years until 1927. The French protectorate continued on until 1956. So resident general uh, Hubert Lyoté ruled in conjunction with the Sultan and his main goal, that is France's main goal was to um, modernize Morocco. So um, um, in, in, um, establish an infrastructure, work on the infrastructure that was there. They did have a road system, but they introduced railways, airports um, in, into Morocco. So in 1927, this, uh, sorry, in 1912, the previous Sultan, he abdicated and then Sultan Yusuf, his son took over and he ruled until 1927. So it gets very complicated, but the Sultan Mohammed V started in 1927 when he was a 17 year old boy. His father died very suddenly from a uremia. So first you have one abdicating and then you have one dying very suddenly. And a 17 year old boy was then left to rule more or less on his own when uh, Marshal Leote was uh, sent to another country. So he ruled more or less from 1927 to 1961. Um, as a young person, he was fairly malleable and France probably thought that was wonderful. One thing he was firm on was in World War II, the French, this was the Vichy government who were allied with Germany, the Vichy government wanted uh, Mohammed to send all of the Muslims in, uh, sorry, all of the Jews in uh, Morocco to France and of course then for deportation to Germany and the um, the gas chambers. He refused. So of course this made France very upset. They started allying with uh, a great nephew of his from another, uh, another grandfather. And uh, so for two years he was in exile. He had three wives, but these three are not his wives. These are his children. I only found one picture of one of his wives. Generally the wives were way in the background. Um, he, in 19... Um, 56, he, in 1955, he returned to Morocco. In 1956, he led the country into independence. 1957, he named himself a king. 1959, he introduced a system of health care for his people. So he was generally a very good king. His son um, took over in uh, 1961 after Mohammed died very suddenly at age 51 following post-surgical complications. So starting in 1961 to 1999, Morocco had its first period of real stability. And if you look at this picture, I bet you can guess why it was so stable. It was also during this time period considered to be one of the most repressive countries in Africa. And uh, that's going a long way. And uh, it often met uh, criticism for its human rights abuses. He had two wives. Then 
the um, this is all the Alawite dynasty from 1960 or 1666 to the present. Now, originally, I had a different photograph here, one that I had taken, but I thought this was much more timely. This king, um, Mohammed VI, is a very modern king. Not only did he decide that he would not have more than one wives, he, he made this public public announcement, and he also made it public that his wife would be a very public figure. So their wedding was public. Her name is Salma. Lala is a an honorific, so Madame Lala Salma, married in 2001, and she supports various charities. In 2011, uh, Mohammed VI decided that he would change it from a kingdom with absolute power to a constitutional monarchy, which means that he still has the ultimate say, but uh, he has 360 elected officials, uh, an elected parliament, in other words, so he's a very progressive king. Not only that, he decided and decreed that Moroccan men would no longer have four wives. They could have a maximum of two. And that was, in, in, for many reasons, a very modern decision, but it also minimizes infighting, as I'm sure you might guess. So let's get going. On to the coast, Tangier, Rabat, and Essaouira. So I hope by the end of this, you will realize that to travel is to discover that everyone is wrong about other countries. So this is Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. Now, I'm not sure when this is a postcard. I'm not sure when it was taken. Sometime after 1865, this is the Customs House Avenue and these buildings back here. One of them is the Hotel Continental. Now, I stayed here on my first trip here in 2006. I absolutely loved it. Um, it was described as showing its age, but I think it's showing its age beautifully. Um, in this presentation today, we're going to see what I call old Morocco, as opposed to the Ville Nouvelle, the French, um, the French quarter that is bright and modern, and you can stay in five and six six-star hotels and eat at uh, Burger King, whatever you want. But um, that, the, and and uh, we owe that divergence of the Ville Nouvelle, the new cities, and the old city to Marshal Leote, who recognized sometime between 1912 and 1927, that these cities, particularly the imperial cities, needed to be preserved. Um, so over here is cut, what I call cut work, and it's done into a moist but drying plaster, and it's done entirely by hand. This is the dining room of the Hotel Continental. Um, the Hotel Continental opened in 1865, and its first official guest was Prince Alfred, the son of Queen Victoria of England. This tile work here, we'll see lots of it. This is Zellig, Z-E-L-L-I-J. And in 1865, each one of these different colors would have been done by hand. In 18, sorry, 1990, there was a movie filmed in this hotel. Um, uh, the Sheltering Sky, written by Paul Bowles, starring John Malkovich and Deborah Winger. This is the breakfast nook. Now, I'm sorry, I would love to have a breakfast nook that looked like this. Absolutely spectacular. This is Hadouj, the maid from the continental, and she only spoke Berber. So Arabic is the uh, language, the offic official language, but there are also three Berber dialects spoken uh, throughout Morocco as well as in the north, they speak Spanish, in the south, they speak Spanish, and in the central region along the High Atlas and Marrakesh, you'll find French spoken. English will be spoken in the major hotels, and I think that's about it. You, you'll find it occasionally at other places, but if you know Arabic, you're really in luck, French and Spanish, that will work very well for you. However, she spoke Berber, and I don't speak Berber, so our, this photo shoot that I wanted, I thought she had a beautiful face, uh, was arranged um, by the concierge at the Hotel Continental. And there were two conditions. The first one was that it be taken in the Royal Suite. And I thought the colors worked beautifully. So I was, uh, I thought that was a great idea. And it had just been vacated by American TV travel guru, Rick Steves and his family. The second condition, which you might imagine, was that I send her photos, which of course I was happy to do through the hotel. She is a married Berber woman. And this little, very faint mark here is a tattoo indicating her marital status. She is from Chef Chouin, about 60 uh, miles to the east. So this is one of the few modern um, scenes you'll see. Tangier's history is very, very uh, colorful, to say the least. Um, from 1939 to 1945, this was called an international zone. Um, 
in just after World War II, ended in 1945, Paul Bowles moved here with his wife. I mentioned earlier, it was the, the start of a very active uh, gay community, very active gay scene. Paul Bowles moved here with his wife, Jane, and it was a marriage of convenience because both of them preferred same-sex partners for um, sex. Uh, in addition to them, we had the Beat Generation. William S. Burroughs wrote, wrote Naked Lunch here. And in 1955, Tennessee Williams, who lived here, wrote a hat on a, a cat on a hot tin roof. So this is the old uh, city. And here is the new city, but the gateway going into the old city. So it's very, very modern. This is a take on the Moroccan flag. Now, William S. Burroughs wrote Naked Lunch when he was living here. He wrote this in 1959, and it referred to the uh, international zone. And in his book, Naked Lunch, which you've seen it, it's a, 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 if you've read it or seen the movie by David Cronenberg, it's a very unusual book. Um, and he, his interzone in it is was taken from the World War II, an international zone here. Now Tangier, not Morocco, but just Tangier was an international zone where spies would come. And this is the Café de Paris and the Place de Paris. And it, spies would come from America, Britain, um, some from Italy, Japan, uh, Spain, and they would sit at these tables. And the tables are arranged so that there's a table and then two chairs, but the chairs face out. So you don't know who's actually doing, who's talking with whom. Am I talking to the person seated beside me or am I seated to the person to the left? Um, and I mentioned Malcolm Forbes earlier. He uh, had his birthday party here. And uh, even though Elizabeth Taylor was on his arms, he wasn't fooling anybody about his sexual preference. So Morocco was a very unusual country with some very definite Muslim uh, rules. And yet they're very, very liberal. This is Rabat, the capital from 1912 to the present. Um, it was designed, um, this is the, the new section, Ville Nouvelle, um, by the, the French protectorate. And it has a very small uh, Medina, which is the old city. But you can see here the, the very real influence of, of France and the architecture of France. For me, Rabat is fun. It's um, a very pleasant city, nothing very exciting, but very pleasant. The best thing to see is the uh, cello, which is the uh, a ruin, a, a Muslim ruin just, just to the south, but adjacent to the city. It was built during the Almohad dynasty. And if you look off here to the left, you can see, I mentioned the Almoravids and the Almohads, both together lasted only 230 years. So you can imagine all the fighting that was going on. So over here, I've written Kubas of the Marabou. So Kuba, a Kuba is one of these shrines and a Marabou is a, a local regional saint with magical powers. This is a, a walled city, a medieval fortified necropolis, meaning it's a burial ground and it uh, has a, a, a walled city or wall around it. These little flower-like um, specks are really, um, white egrets. Now off to the left, more of the architecture. It is a ruin, um, but uh, here we have the Brugmansia and it makes a beautiful plant. It is available here in Canada. I don't rec recommend making a tea of it unless you want to spend the next three days on your back hallucinating wildly. I'm surprised that thrashers sell it, but they do. Um, over here, uh, again, this is during the Almohad dynasty, and we have a, the proportion here of the minarets of one to five. The storks, I point out, because the Muslims consider it a, a, an auspicious sign if a stork is nesting on the minaret. In Asawira, this city looks older than it really is. The wall, and we'll see more of the wall later, the wall here was from 1760 to 7, 1770. Um, the city itself started in the 15th century by Portuguese um, sailors and fishermen, and it was the only port between um, there and Tangier that was open to Europeans. So it was a very closed society. You'll also hear this referred as Suera by locals, and 
also Mogador. So if someone asks you if you're going to Mogador and you haven't got a clue where that is because it won't be on maps anymore, they're asking you if you're going to Essaouira. And they do it on purpose, but they're just teasing in a very nice way. So lots and lots of boats. This is the Scala du Port, and you can walk along the wall and then go up into the top of the building and look over. And here we have Mogador, the original name of the city, uh, and it was known this until as this until 1960. I just happen to love this picture, lots of fresh fruit all over Morocco, and I love the designs um, by the curl, uh, the curling of the skins. This picture, again, I happen to like it just because of the simplicity. Uh, the colors are repeated between the bird and the sky and the building, and it, it's quite contrast. It contrasts quite nicely to this wild but very and beautiful painting um, done on the wall of a restaurant. And this is a nod to the African um, part of, of the, 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 uh, the Negro, the Blacks of, of the rest of Africa. So for example, in um, Morocco, they are more closely aligned uh, with uh, Spain and with uh, France and the Mediterranean in general. So when I was sitting in a restaurant in Casablanca, in the hotel restaurant, and I was there with my bags. I was obviously leaving. The waiter asked if I was going to uh, back home to Canada. And I said, no, I was going to Kenya. He smiled and he said, oh, you're off to Africa, which took me aback for a millisecond until I realized that they're very, very much aligned with the Mediterranean. These are typical wares that you could buy almost anywhere. Um, this is perhaps a bit unusual because of the seacoast area. And uh, this is definitely along the sea. If uh, you want to cook at home, you can get your uh, eels, more eels here, squid, octopus, but these uh, roadside stalls or uh, river waterside stalls are everywhere. Moroccans have a real sweet tooth. This headdress here is uh, the hijab and it's much more common than this, which I've actually never seen in Morocco. This is a chador and uh, a niqab on the face, but it looks like our COVID-19 uh, mask. Of the, the there's 36 and a half million people in Morocco, and as I mentioned, it's very, very liberal country. Here they're demonstrating peacefully. Um, it was no problem getting in right into the crush. This is my shadow right here. And what they're saying is, we are citizens and we are not as slaves, esclavos. And it says the same in, in uh, Arabic. And they're, they're demonstrating peacefully. There were police nearby. Uh, but peaceful demonstrations, um, speaking out is, is encouraged, actually. And in this particular case, they were speaking out about the death of a fisherman who was charged with fishing illegally in, uh, in the Mediterranean. His, his catch was confiscated, thrown into a dumpster. He jumped into the dumpster and um, fortunately was killed. So this occurred in 2019 in May when we were there. And as... Uh, to mark his 20th, uh, 20 years on uh, the throne, King Mohammed VI pardoned uh, many of the uh, people who were in jail and had been in jail before his uh, reign. On to Chef Chouin. This is a really magical city. Uh, perhaps village is more like it. It's, it's hidden in the mountains right about here. And it's also, it has a different name as well. If you get rid of the, these letters here and replace it with just a single X, it's still pronounced the same way, Shawen, Chef Shawen or Shawen. This was, a village was founded in 1471 by uh, Moulay Idris, um, who is the patron saint, and he was the first of the conquerors in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Morocco. And he's a direct descendant of Moulay Idris. And for the next 450 years, only Jews or Muslims were allowed in this village. Uh, between 1883 and 1892, three Christians tried. One was an American who was poisoned and died. One was a Frenchman who disguised himself as a rabbi but fled after an hour. And the third was a, a British journalist who stayed long enough to uh, write about it and he, he managed to escape, but just barely. These, uh, the Muslims and the Jews were fleeing persecution, um, uh, primarily from Spain. In 1920, when the, Span when the Spaniards were uh, moving through uh, Morocco in conjunction with the French um, protectorate, in 1920, when they arrived in Chef Chouin, they were very surprised 
to learn that some of the residents were speaking using words of the Castilian language. The Castilian Spanish is the one that we hear most commonly today throughout the world using words from Castilian that had been extinct for more than four centuries in Spain. That's how isolated this village was. Paul Bowles considered Tangier to be his magical blue city, but for me, this was the magical blue city. And I call this blue cat. Um, I had just walked down the stairs, walked past the cat who was following people in. This is a doormat here and at a house, an entry to a house. Um, and then as I walked down, I heard a, a door slam and a cat cry. So he'd been evicted. This is um, a, a caravan serai, that is a place, a serai for your caravan. And even though it was restricted to Muslims and Jews only, um, this was on the northern trade route. So the trade route going up to Tangier and then west to the coast. The restaurant was really, uh, the food was delicious. I went there often, but the best thing about it was the great view. This is part of the original fort. These are spice towers. Um, and you can see over here, there's a man actually making the spice tower. I think this is turmeric and he's got a plastic on the ground here. Now this takes, you can imagine how long it takes to make each of these spice towers and how easily it could be disrupted by you know, a finger of a little child or someone jostling it. So I wasn't surprised, but I was a little saddened in 2019 when I was there that uh, these have been replaced by artificial cones that have had texture and color added to them. Fes al Bali turns out to be now my favorite city in Morocco. It's very remarkable. It was founded in 789 by Muli Idris, who is the patron saint of Fez al Bali. Fez al Bali is a walled city. It is the old city. If uh, just outside is the Ville Nouvelle. And, is, and again, as I mentioned, if you want to stay in the, the new city, there are lots of beautiful, beautiful structures, but you'll see some of the places that I stayed inside Fez al Bali. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of three that we'll visit tonight. And just over here is Bab Magrouf, and just inside is Bab Boujalud. And I mentioned that just because you notice that there's a wall with gates, and once you get inside, there are more gates. And this is Bab Boujalud. It looks like it could have been constructed several centuries ago, but in fact, it was actually constructed in 1913 um, during the French protectorate era, just one year into the French protectorate. These are typical Moorish arches uh, with the pinched sides and then um, a horseshoe with a, a point at the top. Um, it's considered by most Muslims a very bad thing to represent the human, um, the human form or the human face. So instead, on most of the designs, what you'll see is um, geometric patterns. So it's this typical, a typical Moorish geometric pattern and typical uh, Moorish um, arabesque. So floral details, scroll work. Um, on the other side, this is all tile work. And on the other side, there is tile work as well, but it is of green color, more like this color here on this minaret. This is just uh, scenes of the beautiful tile work, the zellige, the cut work, uh, some wooden carvings. It's just over here, wooden carving, and a close up of the uh, minaret we saw a few moments ago. Walking through Fez um, can be a challenge. Initially, uh, it's not a dangerous challenge, but you can be prepared to get lost. Um, when I first went, I called from on the telephone from Chef Chouin. I I booked a hotel that was a Riyadh, which is like a Moroccan B&B, &B, and I booked it very close to the gate, so I was sure that I'd be able to find it. I never did find it. I hired a guide. He couldn't find it. None, neither of us could find it, so I gave up. I went to another Riyadh, and it all worked out, but in the four days I stayed there, I never, ever found that, that Riyadh. So it is a bit confusing. The streets are all narrow. They're labyrinthine, but they're very cool because of the lattice uh, weaving up above. But you'll notice this sign right here. Now, I think this is a sign for the Karawin Mosque. It'll say right here in English, not Arabic. So it is designed for the traveler. And this arrow points to the left. So if you wanted to go to the Karawin Mosque, you would go down this way. And there's signs all the way along to help you with that. And after a while, unless you're really bad with directions, um, you'll find your way quite easily. 
These are just a sampling of a fairly typical, but I think quite beautiful wares. But I do want to point out here this uh, brass work. These are two brass hands. And you'll notice they have two thumbs. And this indicates the melding of two religions. The one thumb, or one of the thumbs represents Beth, who is the first wife of the prophet Abraham. And the other is uh, the thumb or the hand of Hadija, who is the first wife of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. Rugs, there are lots of them everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And if you can, you can see where I'm talking, right behind me is a rug that I bought um, on my first trip to Morocco. I didn't buy it in Fez. Um, to me, this is just so overwhelming. I'm not a very good shopper. If there's too much to buy, I get completely overwhelmed. So I left, I didn't buy anything. This is where we stayed the most uh, on our most recent trip, Riyadh El Bartel, absolutely spectacular. It's in the Southern part of town, but in the old center. This, uh, these are old homes uh, by very, own, once owned by very wealthy families, beautiful wood carving. Um, this is the entryway to our, our bedroom, which was a, a large suite. Um, and I, I did mention that Leote wanted these preserved. Now, when I say preserved, it's much like when we think of the preservation in Canada of an old structure, it can, it can be restored, uh, but it cannot be demolished if it has her heritage, uh, heritage value. Um, but you can add modern conveniences. So there's electricity, there's hot and cold running waters, you'll have either a shower or a bath or sometimes both. Uh, rarely are there telephones, um, but everybody has Wi-Fi now, so that's not an issue. This is the breakfast um, courtyard and supper at this restaurant, at this Riyadh was also possible. You just had to make arrangements in advance. And we're, I'm actually looking over from our, um, our suite up here, looking over down um, below to the main courtyard. This is a Madursa Bu Anania, and it was built um, from 1351 to 1358. And it was built by Sultan Abu Iman. So he named it after himself. So a madrasa is a school for boys and young men to uh, learn the Quran. It's a residential school that is, they live there. But you can see absolutely spectacular wood carvings here, the tile zelij work, the uh, carvings here into the wet plaster. This cost a tremendous amount of money, so much so that when the work was complete in 1358, um, Abu Inan threw away the ledgers because he didn't want to didn't want to remember how much he'd spent on this particular structure. He was a bit of a character um, until uh, Muhammad VI in, uh, ascended in 1999 and declared that Muslim or Moroccan men could only have four wives. Um, Abu Anan must have had at least four wives, at least four legal wives, and a whole lot more. He's reputed to have fathered. 325 sons in 10 years. So we can do the math there. Um, this is a, again the early an early shot at the at the Madursa. And I was enjoying just the play of light and shadow on the tiles, on the cutwork, on the woodwork. And this imam came and stood in front of me. And until he did that, I was uh, of the impression that uh, most Muslims didn't want to have their picture taken. So he stood there and he stood there and I really, really wanted a picture because the coloring was just perfect. So I raised the camera and he kind of smiled. And unfortunately, I had no way of sending him photos. These are the tanneries. These are specifically the Chihuahua tanneries. There's tanneries in um, Marrakesh as well. There are, these tanneries are in the northeast side of the city near a river so that the colored um, dyes can run off into the river. That's the idea. Um, initially, when the dyes of the leatherwork uh, were started many uh, years ago, um, they used natural dyes. So up here, um, we have saffron. This is poppy, possibly cochineal, which is a bug from South America, just depending on where, if they were, uh, it was available. This is probably turmeric. This is mint just here. Um, and black would be antimony. I think there's a black one right here. So now, however, most of these dyes are chemical dyes. And why that's a problem, if you look, you'll notice that there are people are actually, the men are actually in the dye vats. So you have a man here, there's a man down here, perhaps just climbing out. Um, there's a man here. So they're actually in the dyes needing the, um, 
the hides and, and forcing the dye into the hide. And these tanneries are, they are beautiful, but they're also can be quite repulsive. They're, they, they're attractive and yet repulsive because of course the, sm the smell. I'm right now looking from above from this area here and I've gone down into the tanneries. Um, you pay a little bit extra and they will give you um, something, I think it's mint to put up your nose, but I found that just a whole lot more obnoxious than um, the smell um, itself. So it's quite an experience. This is the Carowine Medursa and Mosque. You um, non-Muslims are allowed to go into this if the mosque uh, is not in session, if worship is not in session. This is uh, considered to be the heart of Fez and perhaps the very heart and soul of Morocco. It was built in 789 by um, uh, Moulay Idris. Another view of the Madursa. And just some street scenes. Again, they love their streets. So we've got nougat. Um, these are all open fronts. So you just walk by and you can look right in. And then of course, I've got some kind of a steel door to close it off at night. This is an apothecary. This is my first trip, um, so it was in 2006, and all this is ar argan oil. And at the time, it was really, really cheap, and he tried to persuade me to buy some. Oh, it was so good for my skin and my hair. And I sort of thought, I was very skeptical, I confess. And here we have some street breads. And they love, love, love their sweets. Lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, the literacy rate is quite high. It's about 60% and increasing. Um, but for some people who don't read, they uh, display what is for sale. So this is a bit gruesome, but you can buy camel meat here. In uh, 1959, Mohammed V did institute a system of public uh, welfare for his citizens. This man is blind. This one has foreshortened arms and legs. Um, however, most uh, a devout Muslim feels obliged to give 10% of their earnings to those uh, less privileged than themselves. And this is what I call um, uh, Moroccan uh, trail, trail mix or energy bars. These are seeds and nuts or seeds and nuts mixed into this really sweet uh, sticky substance. And I took a photo of this guy. He's a very sweet man. I've been there a couple times. And while I was standing there the second time, this a young man came uh, to approach me and he was from the, um, the rug place where I hadn't bought anything. He was very, very persistent, not rude, mm, and not, not threatening, but definitely a very, very persistent, uh, wanting me to come by and why, but come back and why hadn't I bought. And this man interrupted him. And even if I did understand Arabic, he spoke so quickly, I had no idea what he said. But I knew what he said, the gist of it, because at the very end, the young man turned to me and he said, Madame, I am so very sorry, I will never bother you again. This is uh, Abdu at the Glawi Palace. And he, I think he owns the palace. He lives there. It's a, a very dilapidated 18th century um, palace built by uh, Pasha, uh, Pasha Glawi from Marrakesh, but we are in Fez. I just love the textures of the, the, the fabric of his face, of the woodwork behind, um, the ironwork here. Um, he was born in this uh, building and his father was the caretaker and he seems to be the owner. It was described in a guidebook as a rather unusual uh, opportunity to visit uh, someone's personal home and art gallery. But I had a great time and here he is with his best friend. Just a, a shot of a, one of the nooks in his room, in his house. The Volubilis. Volubilis is uh, a World Heritage Site and Jeff and I stayed in a nearby village of Muli Idris. Um, that name is, is omnipotent, uh, omnipresent in uh, Morocco. It's a World Heritage Site as of 1997. Um, we walked, it was about three miles away, so we walked towards the village itself. Um, this is the Roman Basilica, and we'll see a close up of, of it here. This is the Roman Basilica and it's a rectangular structure with lots of open arches. It's used for public gatherings and as a courtroom. Um, and it's always built 
adjacent to or fronting the forum, again, for large assemblies of people. This uh, volubilis is considered a world heritage site because it represents the Roman Empire, uh, the western edge of the Roman Empire and urbanization at the far western regions. It also is considered a world heritage site because of these um, mosaics. There are more than 30 extant mosaics that are generally in this condition, which is really pretty good because Volubilis uh, was inhabited between three, the third century BC to the third century AD. And these are not protected. There's nothing protecting them. There's no uh, shelter above. There's no plexiglass close to the flooring itself. There's a little rope over here that sort of says, please don't walk on me, but people do. Marrakesh is, uh, used to be my favorite city. Mm, it's still definitely worth a visit. Um, this is the shoe souk or the leather souk. Um, and this is the, the shoe souk section of the leather section. Very modern um, uh, Marrakesh airport. And again, it's an international airport, but only for Europe and Africa. This is Winston Churchill. This is not my photograph. Winston Churchill said, if you only have one day to spend in Morocco, spend it in Marrakesh. And I think that the tour buses are really taking that to heart uh, a bit, unfortunately. Um, when we were there in 2019, I swear there were 40 tour buses with 40 people in it. And it was uh, like the invading hordes. This is La Mamounia, named after Mamoun who uh, used to own the land on which this hotel is built. I have not stayed here. Rooms stay, start at about 800 US dollars per night. And the rooms which I've seen are actually fairly ordinary, um, but the public gardens are spectacular. The public spaces are spectacular. Winston Churchill used to come here to paint. He was here only once during World War II. That was in 1943. We came here several times afterwards to paint. Now, this is Place Gemma El Fana, and it is the heart of Marrakesh. And again, this is the old city. It doesn't look terribly crowded here. I must have got it on a, an off day. You can see the French influence here of the Kalash. Now, Gemma El Fana roughly translates into place of hanging. And although no one has anything documented, it's believed that um, people were hanged in the past, certainly not in the recent uh, history. This is the hands of the bride taken, this photo was taken in 2007. So this is a green henna and she'll hold her hands like this for about an hour and then it'll brush off. Now I've had green henna two or three times. Maybe it's my olive skin, I'm not sure why, but when it brushes off, I look like I have some kind of really strange skin disease. The next time I get it, um, the henna, I'm gonna get black henna if you have uh, sensitive skin or a skin allergy, do not get black henna. That square that we saw, Gemma El Fana, at night it changes into food stalls, probably 40 to 60 of these food stalls, depending on the day of the week. Uh, notice the French influence here, la soupe, les dates, gâteau. Um, eating here is very, very inexpensive. It might cost you three US dollars uh, for a, a, a very generous meal. And most of these people are Muslim, but you'll notice over here is um, a, a, a European family and here as well. And again, people are very, very tolerant. I do wear a hat. I wear long sleeves that can be rolled up and a long skirt or pants. Um, they don't expect you to be Muslim, but they do expect you to be respectful of their, their uh, religion and their, their, their country. And this is a close-up of some of the food available. And of course, she's uh, enjoying herself from here. Now, this is a restaurant that's very close. I call it Starry Starry Night. Um, you, if you eat here, it'll cost you about 20 times uh, what it might cost you to eat at uh, the Place Gemma El Fana. Some street scenes, a man here making dowels. Um, and uh, when I first walked up to this, I thought these were some kind of bongo drums, but in fact, they're heated aluminum um, uh, cooking surfaces, and they're making some flatbreads, and they pull it, throw it up and throw it in the air. Some street scenes. These rugs are for sale. Some of the riads that I've stayed at. 
in the Qutubiyah Mosque. As a non-Muslim, uh, I was not permitted to go in here, but this is also considered to be the spiritual center of uh, Morocco. And that Jardine Majorel, this is named after uh, Jacques Majorel, who lived here until 1962 with his wife. In 1980, Yves Saint Laurent and his partner Pierre Berger bought it and restored it. Um, it is absolutely spectacular cactus garden, um, a reflecting pool, there are benches all over the place, um, several uh, different levels uh, which you can relax, there's a restaurant, and, and recently there's now a museum, both uh, Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger have um, died, and it's now run as a foundation. So this is Hadija, Memories of Marrakesh, and we are leaving Marrakesh and moving south 63 kilometers to the village of Imlil in the Kasbah de Dutubkal. So Imlil was a sleepy little village that uh, was not even accessible by road until the advent of mountain tourism. Imlil uh, was in the news a couple years ago. Um, and it was renowned mostly for fruits and vegetables. So it was growing cherries, apples, and walnuts. Now we stayed at the Kasbah du Tubkal. Um, it is a National Geographic uh, small hotel of the world. And it's really, uh, it's like an auberge. It's really quite beautiful. Um, the movie Kundun, Martin Scorsese's Kundun was filmed here before the restoration. And the hotel or the Kasbah is owned by uh, an Amer a, Christian, a British man and uh, a Moroccan partner. And because it's May, the fruit trees are in blossom. And with the advent of, advent of mountain tourism, there are lots of places to stay. The Riyadh, Riyadh, the Auberge. Dar means place, but in this case, it's meaning a place to stay. And this is my um, backpack over here being carted by horse because um, you can drive, you still can't drive all the way to the village. You park at the base of the hill and walk, um, I think maybe about um, half an hour up the hill to wherever you're staying. Um, and we climbed the uh, track, really. It's not a technical climb. We trekked the, uh, the tallest mountain to call in North Africa, and it's part of the uh, Atlas chain. And this over here is a map of, uh, of the, the route itself. I found this harder than doing Kilimanjaro in um, Tanzania, probably because we tried to do it in two days. And I would recommend three if you're planning on doing it. But it was much harder because we just did straight up and straight down. I also recommend taking two hiking poles as the picture here depicts. Um, I also took a picture of this because it's kind of funny. You can call Bushib on your mobile on your way down and have your lunch waiting for you when you finally get with very sore feet and tired legs back into Imlil. So this is our guide Hassan and he and the camelier treated us very very well. This is a midday stop for lunch and we're reclining here on very comfortable uh, cushions. Throughout the climb up and down, they had fresh squeezed orange juice. The beginning of this climb, a trek, uh, a beginning of this trek, um, there was a fellow, um, a vendor, a roadside vendor, um, who offered us some samples. And Hassan reached his hand out, his left hand, and he took the sample, it was, which was fine, and then he plopped it in his mouth. And I was absolutely surprised because, so this was in 2019 when we did this trek. I was very surprised because on, on my four previous visits, I've been warned by almost anybody, do not ever, ever take food in your left hand and put it into your mouth. So I hadn't been there since 2010. So I was a bit surprised, but he was very approachable. So I asked him and he said, hey, we have soap and water now. It's no big thing. Well said. Um, here's the trek. It doesn't look so hard, uh, but it was just a constant uphill. And we're almost uh, at the auberge where we stay overnight, uh, at the Alpine, uh, French Alpine Mountain Club uh, auberge. And down, these women were riding their horses down. And at the time, I remember thinking, gee, I wonder why. Well, the next day, I certainly knew why. I was very tired after this uh, descent. So we're just going to trek up here and up here and around the corner. And we'll be sleeping uh, to bed early and getting up at 3 AM to uh, summit uh, the tallest mountain. And it was great. We had a great time. It was hard, but it was fun. And this is not a good photograph, but it's a telling photograph. So here you can see we're just going straight up, a little bit of a 
not straight up, but it's, it's an upslope all the way. And it's also a various, very dangerous upslope. Uh, when we when we left, it was dark. It was probably 4 a.m. by the time we got this far, maybe uh, not even. And of course, I, you could just see a few feet ahead of you with your with your headlamp. But you'll notice these are people moving along here, and there's absolutely nothing. If you trip and fall, it's a very narrow trail, and you are going to be zooming down the hill uh, and to your death probably. People do die in this track, so if you do do decide to do it, I recommend three days staying two nights in the Alpine um, clubhouse and uh, taking two trekking poles and maybe even an ice axe. Onto the Dadis Valley and where's are that? Uh, this is Kasbah Amradil. So you might hear Kasbah and Kasur. A Kasbah is where the owner of the village lives, the rich person lives. Um, this is Kasbah Amradil as well. And it was in past on the 50 dirham note of uh, the Moroccan currency. And that's roughly worth about five US dollars. So you can see we've come from Marrakesh, uh, the Kasbah, uh, sorry, the double tube call is over here. And then we're moving towards Arzat and the Dades Valley. And the Dades Valley is a palm, uh, a date palm or um, oasis. Another view, looking very much like some of the construction in Mali. This is adobe structure, which we'll see the exterior of, uh, the rough exterior of it the, near the very end. We stopped here uh, to um, buy some textiles. This is um, Mohammed and his sister, Hadijah. And that, by the way, is a lot like a Christian or a Catholic person naming their child, um, um, say, Maria and Joseph or Mary and Joseph. So. Uh, Muhammad, of course, is the, the first, uh, the prophet Muhammad and his wife Hadija was his first or perhaps only true wife. She's a member of a weaving cooperative, but here we're actually in their home. This rug here is commercially built or, or manufactured. It's plastic. It's great for the floor. Uh, takes a lot of time to do a weaving. Here's her loom, her upright loom in the background. So I bought the, um, the wall hanging that's immediately behind my head from um, these people. And by the way, he's pouring Moroccan whiskey, which is Moroccan mint tea, and he holds it up high and moves it up and down, moves the teapot up and down and up and down to create that froth. It's an incredibly sweet drink. Um, everything is, they have a tremendous sweet tooth. Anyway, the rug behind me cost about 80 US dollars. And so I paid cash and I, I wanted a couple other rugs, but I really didn't have enough room and I certainly didn't have enough actual cash. But there are two people in the small group with me. They wanted to buy a big rug. And he said, no problem. We have Visa, which absolutely astonished me. This was my first trip I, in 2006. And I had no idea that they had Visa in this little town called Tiner here. Um, they do have ATMs now, very widely widespread. No problem at all getting, getting money whatsoever. This is where there's that. And we are now uh, near the Atlas Film Studio. And some of the movies film here or near here are The Sheltering Sky, which is the one uh, written by Paul Bowles, Black Hawk Down, Kundun, Sahara, Gladiator, and Alexander the Great. And in the background here, you can see the high Atlas Mountains. So I stayed at Riyadh Dar Kamar. It was built in the 1930s by a Pasha, pa, Pasha Glawi from Marrakesh and um, it means place of the moon. This was on the Wurzurzat and this uh, building were on the, um, the southern, great southern oasis trade route. Here you can see the palmer eye in the background here, the date palms. Ait Benidu is a World Heritage Site. And it uh, is the sand castle that I mentioned, um, a sand castle village. And it um, was a World Heritage Site since 1987. This is the village that's been built up to surround it. During my second trip here, uh, there were sandbags across the river to, um, to, to facilitate travel back and forth. But um, I guess the villagers decided that uh, they could make uh, money by transporting people across using uh, animals instead. This is another view of the Ait Benadu. Ait Benadu is also the scene of many movies, Lawrence of Arabia, Jesus of Nazareth, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Kingdom of Heaven. Here's my camelier. 
uh, it was a very, I think it only cost me like five dirhams, which is almost nothing. And uh, it was a, an interesting ride. It was actually quite fast moving water. The water runs off from the high Atlas mountains. And it, sometimes the roads are closed, not just with a physical barrier, but police uh, staff the gates and make sure you don't cross the barrier. This is inside the uh, village of Ait Benadu. It is a living village. People live in most of these houses. She's making uh, bread. And onto the Sahara. You can stay for an hour or several days by camel, by four wheel drive, four by four. Um, camel is certainly my mode of preference. And this is another group um, that was uh, with me at one point. Um, this is uh, a Kasur, which is a local uh, village. Um, like I been to do with the Kasur, where the Kasbah is where the, the Lord and Lady of the Manor live. Um, you could stay here. Uh, in these Berber tents, or you could stay over here in the right in a small um, cabin, basically. So the same group that uh, I was with that bought the, the expensive rug and used visa, here we are now um, en route to our safari, our four-day safari. And here's just me here. I'm facing the sand so I can take a photo. This is our camelier. And this is... Um, Zara with her youngest, Hafida. She is very poor. She is married. Uh, there are three children, uh, two girls and a boy. Um, her husband is a transport uh, driver. And really, I thought we were in the middle of nowhere. I was so surprised to see this woman. Um, and it's this is called the Hamada Desert, but it's also a Hamada Desert type. So if you were to lay down and have your eyes at, at eye level with the ground, this wouldn't look to sandy it would look black and so that's the other name for it it's the black desert so here's um, a, a structure for animals so it hasn't been properly finished but here you can see the outline of the adobe brick and this is the same type of adobe brick uh, the style used um, in the Gua highlands of guatemala it's very warm uh, when you're inside but it's built from mud clay um, dirt particles um, sand um, straw, a bit of stones, anything you can get and it's lumped in and then dried. And then if that said been a dwelling for humans, she would then put a paste over top of it uh, made of sand and clay. So this is her oldest named Hadija, no surprise there. And here is Hadija cleaning the couscous, the dry couscous, and now lighting the fire for our lunch. The Moroccans are meat eaters, so I ate an awful lot of Berber food, which is vegetarian. This is couscous berber, and this is a traditional Moroccan tagine, uh, or modified from the traditional Moroccan tagine. Moroccan tagine is typically clay. However, um, since we're on a safari and they're heavy and clay breaks, we used aluminum. So this is my guide, and here uh, he's stopping at an oasis to get water. I thought we were stopping at a stick in the desert because that's what it looked like, a big stick with a bit of cloth tied to it, but that indicates, um, so if you're ever lost in the desert, that indicates that you're uh, near an oasis. These guys were great. They sang, they danced, and uh, just you can see the, the tent camp on the back here. Here's a close-up of the tent camp. Uh, the camels are um, tethered and hobbled so they don't run away, and they do run away very fast. And this is the, if I had my chef with me, but this man, Hassan, stays at the tent camp for three weeks on and one week off, and he's the chef for people who just happen by. Here he is without his headdress drinking Moroccan whiskey. And believe it or not, this guy is named uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix, the camel, and he's popping out to say goodbye because it's time for us to make tracks and say goodbye. We thank you very much. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, I do other presentations for um, various uh, other countries in the world. And I'm also a member of the Northern Lights Aero Foundation and the 99th Education and Outreach Committee. Um, and we encourage, uh, we speak uh, to schools, to, any, to anyone, to encourage girls and young women to get involved in aviation and aerospace. All right, thank you very much.